Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. So let's begin our session with a wonderful quote. Sustainability is no longer about doing less harm. It's about doing more good. So for starting a new chapter of learning, I, Anjali Kushwaha, being your host for today's event, wants to extend a warm greeting and good evening for all of you present here. I hope you all are doing amazing. Sustainability is the most sorted term by most of the environmentalists as we have already started experiencing the impact of global warming. But do we really know that there are certain concepts of sustainability that are misinterpreted? So on the behalf of whole Sam's family, I welcome you all today for today's webinar on the topic Unbullshitting sustainability. And to add our guest of honor and today's speaker, Ms. Deshika Prabhakar, it's a great honor to have you with us, ma'am. And we are grateful for your presence. So let me introduce you all to do our uh, speaker. She's sustainability consultant with over five plus years of expertise. She has built and transferred technology such as enzyme additives to degrade petrochemical plastics, low-cost bioplastics, to packaging, eco-friendly sanitary napkin, working with Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, and National University of Singapore. She has also published research paper with over 1,000 plus citations to top peer-reviewed journals, and her prime expertise extend to upcycling both post-industrial and post-consumer for her family business of plastic recycling for 20 years or plus for the company and they supplied the recent stylish recycled quotes to our Prime Minister, Mr. Nare Modi, the most loved brand, Ecolite. She has strongly believes as the best part of our life is supporting student entrepreneurship. And she also worked with many universities and government of Tamil Nadu as a startup mentor. Okay, let me just share my screen. Uh, say no to plastics, save water, save earth. There is no planet B, go green, be clean. I'm sure we all would have heard at least one of these slogans, shared so many WhatsApp forwards, videos, and even voiced out these slogans as well. But when it comes to the action part, how far are we into it? Is there actually any action at all or even a will to act? Better yet, is there a clear awareness on how to act? So breaking down all of this is going to be the crux of my speech today. Uh, very happy morning, evening and night. I heard like uh, people from various, uh, I mean, uh, various uh, places are joining in. So wishing you a very happy day today. And uh, thank you so much for all the cute souls that have joined us today and the amazing introduction. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm very grateful for this opportunity. So as introduced, I am Desika Prabhakar. I'm a sustainability consultant. Uh, I'm actually enjoying every uh, day of my life trying to, you know, do something for the love of environment and uh, making uh, every small uh, possible contribution, whatever I can, by working with some corporates on their climate initiatives and our own uh, recycling industry, which we have, uh, as uh, mentioned in the introduction, uh, where, uh, you know, the view might have seen the video where we had supplied the quotes to our uh, honorable prime minister which he won uh, had uh, won during many of the international summits so very uh, honored and grateful to be able to contribute to environment in all these ways and the best possible way is i get to support a lot of entrepreneurs future entrepreneurs like you guys uh, to you know in your uh, steps to support the environment and into climate action and sustainability so first and foremost, uh, before starting, I wanted to just bow down to each of you guys because uh, it takes a different, like it takes a whole level of heart to work in an NGO rather than just uh, a mere donation. Yeah, donation also definitely helps, but you put your heart and soul and time and energy into actually working on the ground. And I have huge respect for all of you guys. And to see, you know, so much great in initiatives from the uh, SEMS Foundation, I was really humbled to see how great you guys are working on so many projects and spending so much of your uh, time to actually contribute to the ground. So very grateful to Divya for identifying me and giving me this opportunity to actually talk to you guys and share whatever I have learned over these years in this uh, field. So today I wanted to take all of your brains through a model which I want to call as uh, knowing 
thinking, feeling and doing sort of a model. So we first look into uh, what actually is sustainability, what is happening in the in and around this domain and uh, before that, actually, I, I forgot to say one thing. Uh, I, I I don't know if you uh, have been bearded out by the title because the R may, uh, might have questions why, why it is called unbullshitting or what does bullshit have to do with anything in sustainability probably might have had some questions. So I'm going to keep that as a suspense for later as to why I did that. So like a big suspense, but I'm going to tell that to you towards the end. Because uh, it was uh, it was a funny thing that happened that I chose that title. So uh, I'll, I'll tell you guys why I chose it towards the end. And uh, so, yeah, so we will try to know about what is sustainability, what is happening in that area. And then uh, to think, actually, it's about uh, first knowing and actually thinking which is right or wrong. So we have to know whatever we do is right or wrong. And that's how we actually positively contribute rather than going into a negative uh, contribution. So the second half, uh, will deal with um, uh, of the unbullshitting part like how do we uh, take steps how do we actually take action and what are the ways in which we can do that in our everyday lives so the first half will deal with uh, knowing and uh, thinking about all the right ways or what are the myths breaking down the myths and second half will deal with unbullshitting part okay yes so level one is going to be the no part so uh, by this time, I'm sure you would have heard like n number of uh, de definitions for sustainability, so many jargons that go around it, uh, global warming, climate change, greenhouse gases, all of the, all of this coming under this uh, whole broad uh, title of sustainability. So this uh, actually, uh, the basic thing that you might have heard is about uh, uh, this definition is very, uh, very widely used, like fulfilling the needs of the current generation without compromising needs of the future generation in terms of an economic environment and social well-being uh, prospects. So this is what they usually call it. But I don't want to give you such a broad definition. So I, I kind of simplified it to a very, very uh, simple uh, term, which I keep in mind, uh, you know, when I do my everyday practices. So this sustainability is simply equal to a word called sasta. Uh, which is ex exactly the opposite of what is actually being um, uh, perceived uh, as, as to sustainability because sustainability is uh, seen as something which is very expensive for an individual also you have to make some swaps it's going to cost you more or for corporates you have to change technology it's going to cost you more but it's completely false sustainability is equal to sasta which means being as cheap as frugal even in your thoughts, in your decisions to take any products or choice of your uh, the technologies that you use is how simplified you are is actually uh, the most sustainable thing you can do, being as simple as you can. So this whole definitions, all of this, uh, I just want you guys to delete and take in mind that sustainability is being as simple, as cheap, as frugal as you can with your thoughts. If you do this uh, in your everyday itself, it's going to uh, contribute very, very, uh, and it's going to have a very high impact for sure. So it's all about the thought that you fix up. If you think that it's going to be expensive, then it's a negativity surrounding it. But however, when you uh, see the simplicity of it, it's as easy as you can get. Uh, so in yes, so when we go on to more of knowing part, I wanted to tell you guys uh, about this degree which we talk. That is the temperatures, and uh, from uh, most famously, you might have heard. All of you definitely might have heard about the Paris Agreement. So Paris Agreement is like sort of a holy grail for us. And uh, in that Paris Agreement came this 1.5 degree and 2 degree, which is uh, which is kind of everything that we fixate on in sustainability. So the, no doubt, you know, the earth is in a very pathetic stage, uh, unfortunately. And uh, all of the nations had vowed that we are going to keep the temperatures at uh, well below 2 degrees and best we are going to try to limit it to 1.5 degrees. So this is what the Paris Agreement says. And we all readily have already experienced and are living the climate consequences even now. So in, it is in a, Earth is in a pathetic, a pathetic state even now. But what, what about this 1.5 degree and 2 degree is, is the level, the fold of the consequences that we are going to face that is going to be super extreme. The folds are so high. If you look at the extreme heat, it's going to be 2.x times more worse. Uh, there's going to be uh, increased uh, 
melting of the uh, arctic there's going to be so much of loss of species loss of food security and uh, all the consequences that we face are going to be so much extreme when we uh, let it go up to a 2 degree uh, global uh, temperature so unless we limit it to uh, less than 2 uh, degree best at 1.5 we are going to face extreme consequences even far more worse than we are facing now so despite knowing all of that despite knowing that we are in such a bad shape uh it is really unfortunate that uh, although many countries are taking great steps uh are setting a lot of targets goals to uh, contribute effectively and uh, you know uh, translate all their technology and products into uh, creating impact in, in climate action what we see is uh, the climate action tracker which uh, tracks the whole of uh, all the countries and their efforts to climate change what we see here is most of the countries are still in a insufficient and highly insufficient uh, sort of a uh, bandwidth so there is still a long way to go as rightly said uh, you know in the introduction as they mentioned still a long way to go for us to uh, contribute and to put forth all our efforts to uh, bring climate action into the forefront so yes so with that uh, we understand that uh, basics of the present scenario and uh, what is actually happening on a global front and what are the steps uh, and what is the current scenario that is uh, been occurring so uh, now we have to go into a very important state of thinking so why i put thinking in a in a uh, why i said important is because it's not about uh, understanding uh, the it's not about using jargon it's not about uh, uh, just choosing as an eco friendly product i'm just going to get it but it's about actually knowing what is uh, the right choice not just the green choice because most of the times the so called green choices are not actually green so once you know what uh, the choices are and what how do we actually take a right choice that's going to make a significant uh, difference and will help you make informed decision so only when you have a, a good grip on the uh, level of understanding of a product and what its real time impact is then we can make the best choices for an environment so it's not about doing it's actually about doing it right which is going to make the significant impact so in this i want to start off by telling you that uh, you know i'm sure we all might have had this villain character in our lives sort of a nemesis maybe in school in college or a boss at work probably uh, we all have our versions of uh, any villain character maybe like i don't know i don't want to say thanos but uh, because I, thanos is kind of my favorite but uh, maybe regina or uh, lord voldemort or someone right like any villain character you like we all have had that villain character and for the whole field of sustainability the most unfortunate thing is plastics are the like the villainous top villains they villainize plastics so much uh, you know coming from this field uh, i've seen first hand what uh, goes on in the whole industry from the production side to the recycling side to the end of the life cycle of plastics so it's not really uh, plastics that has to be villainized right it's actually unfortunate that plastics are so much villainized because if you see here the global greenhouse gas emissions data the industry that is the chemical and petrochemical industry uh, making manufacturing of plastics contributes actually to 3.5% of the global emissions but when you compare all the other spectrums of energy transportation building even fashion they are very very huge uh, contributors to greenhouse gas emissions globally so uh, however what gets caught in all of this is uh, plastics so the whole uh, thinking around plastics is not uh, a very positive it's just labeled straight out as negative however it's not really plastics which is the problem it's about our behavior how we are treating plastics how we are uh, disposing plastics how we are improperly uh, you know not segregating and improperly disposing plastics littering all these kind of bad behaviors is what has contributed to uh, such a uh you know problem in terms of pollution however if we treat plastic right it is able to be recycled in number of times and it has uh this uh, sort of a life uh, a shelf life that it has is going to be great for a product so uh, it's about our responsibility to use it in the most uh, effective and proper manner so the next uh, most hyped 
concept is the circular economy so circular economy basically uh why i have put circular is because so with circular economy everyone says circular economy is this circular economy is that it's going to be great yeah it is great as a concept but in circular economy the concept uh, indicates as you see in the image that all products are going to be recycled back in a never ending loop so circle is like a never ending loop everything will be recycled reused recycled reused like that and nothing will go into the environment but the technology that we use right even state of art technology if you have all of it has certain limitations and we cannot achieve that level of high recycling rates as of uh, now that is the current scenario even in the case that there is technology like say there is like very high level uh, chemical recycling they call it that is with your plastics you can bring back the uh, monomer molecules and uh, again reuse them again you use them for remanufacturing so there are some high level techniques of uh, chemical recycling there's pyrolysis there's so many techniques but all of these are super energy intensive one next they are very capital intensive so not all of them can uh, go into setting up an industry or setting up you know units to uh, use these technologies on the ground level so does it really get to be happen uh, get to happen in a ground level is a big question and it's not uh, very feasible on a large scale is what uh, is hindering the whole scenario so circular is uh, not actually a solution per se but your whole goal should not be about re uh, reusing or recycling it should completely be on reducing so there should be more emphasis on first of all reducing the production rate itself reducing the usage itself rather than actually going to reuse recycle sort of a phenomena so this attitude of again bringing it into a loop is not technologically feasible at now uh, at present as well as in a commercial sense it's still not making uh, the level of uh, strides that we expect okay so next the stains of sustainability so before i delve into this stains i want to tell you guys about a concept called life cycle assessment so uh, life cycle assessment is like our bread and butter right it's like everything for anyone in the sustainability field uh, everyone definitely would uh, have uh, come across sorry would have um i i mean would have heard about what is lca or is life cycle assessment definitely uh, this is like one uh, one for us in the field so what is life cycle assessment and why i want to tell you uh, about life cycle assessment is for any product or any technology if it's actually green or not is it actually uh, you know making a positive impact on the environment we can uh, know it only through doing a life cycle assessment so in a life cycle assessment what happens is uh, it's an analysis where they carry out a study from the cradle stage the birth of the product till the factory gate stage till the factory uh, production site or even till the grave site that is the end of life site uh, end of life uh, stage so from a cradle to a gate or a cradle to grave sometimes even a cradle to a cradle that is a circular economy which we spoke about all these kind of uh, studies are taken place for a product or a technology from raw material side choosing the raw material extracting it from the natural resources do taking care of the manufacturing the production usage when it gets to our hand our usage and once we throw uh, throw it off the disposal how does it degrade what is the end of life all of this prospects uh go into the study and the carbon emissions at every stage are recorded analyzed predicted using software so or manually they do the calculations and validate what is the actual impact so once you know this value for every product only then you can understand how significant it is contributing to uh, positively to the environment or is it negative uh, contribution when we take the lca values of the products the carbon emissions levels of the products then only we can do the comparison and make better choices so even if it's a product or technology like i said lca is very very important to make any choices so knowing this i'm going to give you some of the uh, the stain part of sustainability the products and technology how is it actually um, um, is it actually uh, having a reduced emissions or not so first and foremost i want to talk to you about uh, the bio based products so bio based products 
lot of bio bio compostable biodegradable uh, there's so much you know bio based uh, products uh, that is so much talk around it so i first i want to clarify all the different uh, bio sort of topics bio compostable which uh, you are getting the carry bags nowadays right the bio compostable bags which you are getting uh, those kind of uh, it will be labeled as bio compostable and it is also advocated by the government uh, to be used in many of the states bio compostable simply means that that product is compostable under specific industrial conditions that is the product as such it cannot degrade like once you throw it it will not degrade you have to provide a temperature usually in industrial composting it's around like 70 degrees or so where you, where uh, it can be put in together and then it will uh, compost and uh, become become a compost so that is the uh, bio compostable uh, jargon that is the meaning of it bio based if you say bio based are basically products that are made from renewable energy sources uh, any natural uh, derivative for that matter it's bio based but bio based does not necessarily mean that it's actually biodegradable so biodegradable what does it mean is it's something which naturally degrades into co2 and water and biomass so naturally like your leaf all of that natural products just on their own they degrade into co2 water and biomass so biodegradable bioplastics all of these bioplastics are suggested as alternatives which are made from bio-based origins so this is what the bioplastics is Bioplastics, the main one that we see today is something called PLA, polylactic acid. It's basically from your corn. And there's also plastics that come from cassava, that is like a starch, a cassava starch derivative. You get so much of uh, products for, from different starch uh, sources where uh, they are converted into films and used for carry bags uh, more recently. So all of this come under bioplastics. Here, why I'm talking about all of this is when they did a life cycle analysis of bio-based bags, carry bags and PP, that is polypropylene, which is a petrochemical derived uh, plastic, they saw that the PP bag actually consumes lower energy than the bio-based bags. The bio-based bags, which you are seeing now, is uh, actually uh, um, how do I mean? uh, suggested by the government as an alternative uh, that you should use since they're banning all the plastic bags, right? The single use bags. This is suggested as an alternative. But when you see if there's a scientific validation, no, there is no scientific validation. Uh, when you see the LCA, only when if uh, the bio-based bag is made from a geothermal source and if it's ensured that it is composted, then when you see number 14 towards the end, only then the energy consumption is low. But by practical uh, versions of how it's going on now the electricity uh, consumed is still fossil based and it's most of it is still landfilled so number six is what is happening in reality now rather than actually being composted or recycled so this is the reality behind the uh, whole situation and uh, when they advocate or suggest uh, these kind of alternatives that should be scientific indication that clearly shows how this is going to be good for the environment and there should be awareness on how they should dispose the product. So this is very essential. Otherwise, they are all just ego products. So another very, uh, how do I put it, like a uh, heartbreaking thing for me was the bamboo brushes. I'm sure uh, the bamboo brushes you guys might have uh, heard about or probably you guys, some of them might be even using the bamboo brushes, I think. So this was like, uh, you know, I was very fascinated by this and I was like uh, using it for a long time when I came to know this bamboo brushes. But when I did my research, uh, you know, I understood that uh, the bamboo brushes, the bristles that you brush with, right? Like the bristles are still made of plastic. And when you finished, uh, when you're finished using the product, you should actually pluck it out and dispose it, which... I'm sure nobody's going to do that. You don't have the uh, time and energy to actually do that. So that's not, and they're very, very small. It's very difficult to recycle them. That's one thing. The other thing is studies, again, the L LCA, the life cycle assessment, 
show us that a plastic brush which is reusable and recyclable is more eco friendly is actually less energy consuming and less emissions rather than the bamboo brush uh, even in comparison to an electric toothbrush or the brushes which come with a reusable head so when compared to all of this plastic brushes are better is what the study has also said so that's why it's very important for us to actually analyze and think before we uh, go for choosing a product because the choices that we make again uh, if we are like today we are talking i'm suggesting you a bamboo brush you go tell five other person they also buy bamboo brushes the wrong chain starts out we want the right chain to form not the wrong chain so that's very important when we choose such uh, products let's talk about the technology now so renewable 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 solar wind even nuclear everything is being talked about uh, very hugely so renew is it really renewing something or uh, what is really happening i wanted to tell you guys so yeah solar all of these alternatives are great but it's also important to look into how much energy is being uh, um, consumed into the production side and how ethical is the whole setup happening so when you take uh, the solar uh, when you see again the lca if you see here the production you see the big red bar it's so high in, in uh, consuming energy uh, however the recycling if they do it right if they recycle the solar panels effectively then great but still there is no stringent laws into recycling point of view and there is uh, no not much pressure into recycling rather than actually fitting up the solar panels that's one thing that we should really emphasize on where uh, to understand that uh, production is actually consuming a lot of energy and recycling should also be promoted to an equal extent the other thing is about the uh, uh, lithium consumption that is all these raw materials that goes into your battery production and all so that uh, i'm sure you would have heard about all this child labor involved in mining activities in uh, republic of congo and so many uh, countries like that where this is uh, really a very uh, sad uh, thing to see where you know the child labor uh, is incorporated heavily into such activities apart from that also during uh, installation of windmills or all these uh, solar panels the lands that they set up these on there's huge amount of land consumption right so most of the times what happens is a lot of uh, native uh, communities which are there the indigenous people are forced to move out as well as a lot of species are getting electrocuted as you can see uh, into uh, hitting into the uh, all of these setups so it is very important to uh, make sure that we take protective measures when we do all these setups and we take care of our uh, other living creatures as well okay so eod that is the end of life uh, so end of life is actually in a time of death stage why because what is end of life i'll just tell you so end of life is basically the end of life of a product what happens towards the end of life of a product is it recycled to go back into another product or is it going to be put in the landfill is it going to biodegrade there are so many scenarios so what the people do is uh, you know like if i imagine people sitting across uh, in a conference room they are sitting and sketching products nobody is or whoever the guy is or girl is like sitting there they are not thinking about like how this product is going to die nobody is thinking about death uh, maybe it's positive that they are thinking about death but the point is they have to think about you know how it's going to affect the environment right like what is going to be the end of life of this product well, why i'm talking about this is as you see these covers here right like there are uh, there's a silver coating inside you would have seen the chips packet that we get or even like paper packaging that comes now you know for your uh, uh, evening snacks and all which you see which you get in the paper packaging uh, even toothpaste right like you have a silver uh, thing inside so this is mainly for protecting the uh, moisture and the smell and all of the aroma all of that into the product and the taste flavor everything so it is important from a functional point of view but when you think from an end of life point of view it's impossible to recycle this and it does not uh, have any sort of uh, uh, even technology to do this because it's very difficult to separate both of them and extract value out of it so most of the time it goes uh, it does not uh, get to be recycled this is a big flaw that we have to correct during the design stage itself and carbon capture utilization and storage popularly called as ccus 
So carbon capture, utilization, and storage. Uh, one second. Okay. So carbon capture, utilization, and storage is also considered a very big end of life solution. Uh, you guys might also have uh, heard that uh, or seen that big machine where it directly captures carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. I think it's in Ireland. Uh, it's uh, by Climbworks. And uh, that company has set up a big machine where there's like so much of fans and it directly captures CO2 from the atmosphere to convert it uh, for use or store and keep it. So uh, store and keep it and convert it into rocks again. So what happens here is, first of all, in the air, there are so many other uh, gases and other molecules also, right? Like CO2 actually forms very low percentage, 0.04% uh, zero, zero or zero, four. Yeah. So uh, there is a very small percentage. So extracting that from the atmosphere is going to be very, very uh, practically impossible, uh, even if we have the huge uh, uh, level of machines. However, you know, people uh, fail to see the solution, which is right in front, and then they go on to find fancy uh, solutions. So I'll give actually does the same thing, which is again, it captures CO2 and converts it into products, right? Like it's the basic photosynthesis and algae is our uh, dearest ancestor. Like we all originate or have uh, sort of uh, evolved from algae. That's what uh, science says. So algae is actually there very happily converting all that CO2 into very uh, value added products for us. And we just like choose to ignore it and kind of go into setting up machineries. Uh, however, the uh, approach should be in a way that you have algae and try to build technology which accelerates that algae to consume CO2. So that should be the way to go uh, to involve, uh, you know, natural bio-based concepts itself into your whole end of life option. So this is also something that uh, we should uh, consider. Next is uh, something called EPR and ESG. So EPR is what we call it as uh, extended producer responsibility. So these two, what uh, why I've added is uh, we saw about technologies, saw about products and all the um, approaches that we should take there, right? Like this is again some initiatives that the government and several countries take uh, in an attempt to uh, so let me okay oops okay so in an attempt to uh, build. Uh, on their climate action, EPR and ESG are certain uh, very important initiatives. So in EPR, what happens is the producer of uh, who is responsible for using that pa plastic packaging, who is responsible to introduce that plastic packaging into the environment is going to take the responsibility and recycle it and ensure that all of the products that they put out, which has the packaging is recycled. So if say uh, an FMCG company is selling biscuits and chips and all of that. So they, they're putting that packaging out there. So we are eating it and throwing it out. So it's their responsibility to collect the plastic packaging back. So this is uh, emphasized as a law in many of the countries now. And especially in India now, this is very uh, highly uh, trying to be adapted highly, I would say. Uh, however, there is uh, a need for a lot of scrutiny, a lot of authenticity checks to ensure that uh, all of this uh, doesn't only take place on paper and, you know, it's all wild away, but it actually translates to something where they go and collect it and ensure that it's recycled. So a lot of stringent uh, action is very much uh, essential in this particular uh, initiative, as well as uh, EPR, not only for plastic packaging, but also for textiles, as I mentioned, fast fashion and all these things which are happening in fashion, the rush and the demand for a lot of textiles. We need to bring EPR, this responsibility in fashion and textiles as well. Because in textiles, uh, because of the huge consumption and uh, the mix of products, recycling is so, so difficult and it must be uh, ensured that the producer takes responsibility here as well. So when we talk about ESG, so ESG now is like uh, uh, mo um, the, the sustainable, sustainability as a term is kind of like metamorphosized into ESG, I would say, because the ESG is like the trendy kid uh, who or a trendy, a trendy person uh, whoever that is in your uh, gang, you can consider the, that uh, as ESG because that's like the full on uh, hype uh, concept now. So ESG, what is that? ESG is basically environment, social and governance. So E is environment, social governance is basically your legal uh, frameworks and uh, how the company works on in terms of uh, all the legal um, 
prospects are they ensuring uh, abiding by law all of this in terms of uh, corruption policies etc etc so this is what esg is so esg what uh, uh, why and how it came into picture basically is it's been there for a long time however it's uh, come into effect uh, more recently in india they have uh, said that it's uh, mandatory for uh, top 1000 companies to disclose their esg uh, sort of aspects in terms of a uh, framework called brsr i'm not going to put lot of uh, uh how to abbreviations to you just going to tell you the concept so in terms of a concept this esg basically forces all the companies to uh, fully disclose to show the people what they are doing for the environment how they are taking care of their social status is that is the labor uh, policies uh, abuse policies harassment policies what are they doing and in terms of governance the corruption policies the uh, technology theft or all of this digital policies all these things what they are doing how they are taking care of this and how are they going to positively impact uh, and for the economy as well as environment and the whole country as such so what the problem here is yeah, of course it's an excellent thing that people are trying to you know uh i mean uh, company should disclose all of this yes but what happens is there's so many methods like there's so many ways in which the company can do this reporting so it's not like you just go uh, fill up a form or something like that it's like there are so many ways that companies are freely allowed to go uh, take up this uh, sort of reporting they can use different standards there are so many standards and the people uh, can uh, use any uh, standard they want any company can use any standard they want to report it and there is also rating agencies i think there's more than 600 700 rating agencies to giving to give the rating for these people like uh, uh, if they are doing well or how they are scoring uh, so options right since there's so many options uh people uh, see that uh, they can easily make their way into writing or choosing which one is very um, into their favor they choose things which are very favorable to them so there's no one size fits all there's no a very standard uh, framework saying that like you only there's one thing everyone uh, uh, kind of follow this then it's pretty much easier to even compare right so if there's two companies one is following one framework another is following another framework one is being rated by one agency another is rated by other agency then how will you compare and see which is best uh, doesn't make sense on a broad level so all of this is actually uh, unfortunately the next thing is all of this is focused mostly for the investor so you know companies uh, are uh, studied by investors when we invest everyone uh, individuals when we look into stock options we check into the companies ratings and all of that right so investors are uh, especially in europe they are all mandated to invest in green companies invest in companies with high esg scores too so all of these reports are you know decorated in a way that it pleases investor and not more into the impact side so when you look at the impact is it really uh, about making a difference or is it about just fulfilling some tick marks some of the uh, rules or regulations that are out there so that is a big question uh, and it's very debatable as well and another uh, point is as i mentioned there's no one standard right so what happens is uh, there is a lot of changes in the standard as such people mm, the uh, organizations the authority the, uh, the legislative bodies all of this keep changing some of those standards even in europe there's like so many the changes that have been passed to evolve this esg standard and when there's so much of change people like the companies uh, are a little overwhelmed you know from their perspective and they don't know which one to choose there's a lot of lack of data which is of high quality and there's a lot of uh, just verbose words put up and not really uh, translating into action point of view so there's so much of uh, uh, gimmicks going on around these space behind the scenes as well i thought you guys should know about all of this before you know uh, getting all uh, fancy by the concept as such even uh, elon musk uh, i think mentioned <laughs> excuse me there was an issue with the esg rating where his company was removed from the rating system itself and exxon mobil which is a uh, in the petrochemical field like uh, they have been given the highest rank uh, so there are so many ways you know how this can be up for debate like each one have their ratings each one is uh, fancied about the other so it should have uh, a very universal standard and a very universal rating that can 
uh, really push this uh, into a bigger agenda for climate action. Okay. So yeah, we come to one of my favorite parts that is uh, greenwashing. So greenwashing, I'm sure you guys might have also heard about what is greenwashing. Greenwashing is basically like false marketing, right? Like just telling stuff which is not true, just uh, um, saying that your product is environment friendly but it's actually not in simple terms that's pretty much it so there's seven sins of greenwashing i always make it a point to uh, highlight this in any of my speeches because uh, the no matter what you do if you avoid uh, these sort of greenwashing based products or technology you are like already contributing greatly to the environment right it's not about doing um, like great things or great lifestyle changes if you, if you avoid such uh, wrong decisions itself like it's going to be a major contribution so in this there's a sin of hidden trade-offs hidden trade-off basically is like uh, they say one thing but hide off the other stuff right so for example mcdonald's what they did is uh, they switched their plastic straws with a paper straw uh, and this became a big scandal they said it's like great and uh, it, we have reduced plastic all of that but the pla the paper straw they didn't ensure the recyclability of it and how is the end of life of it and it was heavily criticized that uh, it didn't cut down as much of the plastic and impact on the environment that uh, it claimed. So there was a lot of uh, scandal around it. Uh, even Starbucks uh, also had introduced a lid without a straw and uh, uh, they said that we are removing straws and we are environmentally conscious. But actually, when you see the weight of the plastic was more as to where the, uh, you know, because they had an opening extra kept out, the weight was more to replace it. So it was kind of equated towards the change so it dis doesn't matter uh, that uh, the difference was very negligible so no proof basically means that there is no scientific backing to validate uh, the the proof or the claims that they have so in our terra toys report what happened is this something called bpa uh, you might have heard it so it's there in your uh, baby bottles uh, and basically water bottles bpa free is not really uh, good it's a, it's a it's a toxin and uh, now bpa free bottles <clears throat> uh, or feeding bottles all of this you get uh, but what happened is when they saw the report the claim of bpa free was not validated there was no proof for the same so all of the products that we choose uh, we have to validate if there's actual proof behind that claim uh, sign of vague language basically is uh, so uh, it's just being abruptly vague about using very ambiguous languages to make all the claims all natural, all green, and like uh, um, all of these claims seem to be make uh, seem to make the product very great and green, but in reality it's not. Uh, and a lot of vague language has been used by a company called Patagonia. It's been very very criticized. Um, for uh, sort of greenwashing claims, even though they have uh, been awarded uh, the United, I think UN Champions of the Earth Award, they still uh, and they actually gave off their brand and they said they're gonna uh, put all the profits into uh, you know climate based initiatives and all of that. Uh, but uh, the language uh, didn't really clearly state how they're gonna do it and uh, what is actually the impact if the profits are completely going there or not and uh, again when you see the real picture the the textile as such the materials that go into it the energy that goes into it still they are depleting natural resources right so it's like they're depleting natural resources and funding again money to to save natural resources for that you should like pretty much not do anything again so that would have made sense. So in that way, uh, there's a lot of vague language. Again, false labels. False labels is simply like using, uh, you know, claiming or putting labels which make you believe that it's a original or a green product. So here, uh, there is something called an equal label index. I can share it with you guys. That has all the original certified uh, labels uh, like your uh, go green there's like a certified label for everything uh, there's a there's a cruelty free bunny label so all of this uh, you have to uh, I mean I would uh, love for you guys to know what is the real certification so that you don't get uh, uh, attracted and go into uh, the false labels which are there and get misled as uh, consumers so next is irrelevance irrelevance is simply like Claiming something which is absolutely irrelevant and making uh, the uh, face that you are a green company. So irrelevance here is so CFC you guys know is uh, is banned actually the, uh, the it's it's a, since it's toxicity it's been banned. But what they say is the product is CFC free all of that. 
So that doesn't make sense. It's already banned. So it doesn't matter, right? Like all of these claims, you should stay away from. Lesser of two evils basically is like uh, uh, your uh, cigarettes, right? Cigarettes are harmful. However, they say organic cigarettes and promote it doesn't make difference. Same way Burger King was also uh, accused for this. They uh, claim that they have reduced uh, uh, their uh, methane of the beef burgers that they are uh, selling. But in reality, the difference was very negligible and such a claim could not be made. The final one, again, fibbing. Fibbing is straight out lying, just lying abruptly uh, in terms of a marketing. There are so many examples. Uh, so where Volkswagen uh, had uh, diesel cars, uh, they claim that their diesel cars uh, limit less than the petrol cars. And uh, however, the data uh, which they faked, it showed that it was 40 times more than the limit. And uh, even Shell, the oil corporation, they had uh, an oil sands project that they used that was also very heavily criticized. Uh, so it's about extraction of energy in a more efficient way. Uh, along uh, Alberta, but uh, what happens is this whole process was very, very energy intensive and it was eight times more uh, negative impact, uh, eight times more it was created rather than the original, using the original fossil fuel method. So all of this uh, sense of greenwashing, you guys could be really aware of and uh, um, stay away from these products. So we come to the final part of the uh, session. So this is one of the most exciting parts. I always get like super excited when I come to this session because uh, see, we talked about so much of heavy, heavy topics uh, uh, and uh, all the you know negativity that goes on, uh, the approaches which are wrong and needs to be right. We spoke about so many things, but the real uh, emotion comes uh, and uh, into this section and that's why I really love this section. So uh in this section we are going to talk about love so love is of much need now i think uh not only for the single people here but i mean general saying for every one of us love uh why because uh it, it's really an emotion that helps us to take uh, action into a greater level. You can see here the concept of uh, consciousness of love. So why I'm talking about this uh, emotion, love concept, all of this, uh, you may think it has nothing to do with the environment, but uh, no. Why? Because uh, so when I was, uh, you know, starting my journey and all of that, um, the whole uh, reason behind why I'm working in this field or enjoying my work every day is because of the love. That's one thing. But I understood that when you have to push other people to also take action, it should be part of their emotion, right? Like it should be etched into their emotions. They should also feel something for the planet because we don't, uh, from our school times or, uh, you know, colleges, what we remember is falling down the stairs, fighting and breaking our bones, getting fractured, you know, fighting with our friends, or we remember the heartbreaks. Uh, all broken hearts during college or we remember getting yelled at in front of so many people by our uh, bosses and all of that that we remember so well but we don't recall any algebra or whatever division addition derivation that we do in school or college because the emotion that we have uh, have is uh, goes into our memory and that memory helps us to take action uh, in our day-to-day -day life. So emotion equals memory equals action is what I've understood and believe strongly. So all of the memories which are webbed and uh, from our emotions, we feel it and that is what pushes us to take action. And this is something I very strongly believe. So instead of, you know, putting blame on the corporates, you are doing this, that, and uh, having a fear or guilt that you are not contributing to environment, not taking any action, or you're polluting the planet, anxiety and fear about climate change, consequences, all of this, you can just all wipe out all of that and then think about love uh, as a proven technique. The level of consciousness you can see here that with love into your uh, actions, it is going to maximize your effort and outcomes. Uh, so the positive, uh, this will give you a positive thinking and positive action. So love is going to actually help you take a lot of action. And uh, we really need so much of love uh, to get extraordinary outcomes for saving our planet is what I wanted to tell you guys in this uh, section. Yes. So with that feeling of love in our air, kidneys, liver, everything, I want to go to the final section of uh, doing that is to take action. So basically, uh, this unbullshitting part we are going to deal with here and uh, the unbullshitting part basically simply starts with the mindset. So be it just living on earth, saving earth, 
everything uh, every day mindset is what gets you through every day uh, i'm sure you might uh, you will definitely agree with me here so we all uh, have to understand that we all are heroes and heroines in our lives and we are you know very important individuals we are celebrities actually for earth because we are whatever action we take is going to really influence uh, and shape the mentality of people around us also so we have that uh, sort of a responsibility uh, in every action that we take and uh, so the first thing that you guys uh, must consider is the just one mentality to control or delete the soul mentality that is saying that it's just one uh, chocolate wrapper just one more uh you know a uh, packet of chips or whatever that i'm throwing uh, just one just one mentality has brought everyone into this sort of a pollution crisis so we need to delete that mentality and know that even one is going to matter a lot and one is going to make a significant difference so uh, i mean that, that doesn't mean that you have to go like uh, be so hard and fast on yourself and uh, you know just drop everything surrender everything all give up all your uh, interest and go into complete zero waste lifestyle no nothing like that just start with you know what i'll do whatever i can maybe i can change one thing i can swap out one product and that is also going to uh, you know start out a, a significant change process right it's a start so you don't have to go into a zero waste i'm going to be zero waste i'm i'm not going to have anything uh, no plastic no nothing nothing like that you just have to start from i'll do what i can and you know manifest that even small steps are going to go a long way best part is you get to save a lot of money and you have good health when you reduce the use of a lot of products so it's a win win situation either way so this itself is going to contribute a lot a lot more than you can imagine so uh finally i wanted to give you guys something to chew upon and uh, some choices that you can make so as an individual as a community and as a country and influencing the country as a whole you guys can make a lot of difference in your every day so as an individual let's start with individual so in individual what you can do the best thing that you can do is first voice out and drive demand for very good very authentic green products like products which are actually certified green may ensure that you know when you go uh, ask for such products you are asking for a biodegradable napkin in the shops to be available then make sure it's available when you increase uh, increase the demand only people uh, will start manufacturing such uh, authentic and good products so the best thing that you can do as an individual is to uh, drive the demand for a product familiarize yourself with all these uh, important uh, terms that you see in the products like fair trade fair trade basically means that uh, the goods that are bought during the whole process uh, they have exchanged a fair amount of uh, money to buy those goods and uh, the whole process as well everything has done in a fair way uh, and uh, the laborers everyone have been paid fair uh, in a fair uh, i mean fair wages so ethical again the uh, whole labor policies they are not very strict or uh, you know beyond uh, proper uh, human ability to work they are not pushed or anything they are very ethical cruelty free is no animal testing a uh, green certification is again there's an authentic list of green certification and ocean friendly basically means that uh, it does not affect any ocean organisms marine organisms or uh, there is no microplastics which go into the uh, oceans excuse me so because the uh, microplastics as you might know are uh, are are uh, part of lot of products that we use uh, like our personal care products uh, many of the personal care products has micro beads in it which again mix into the ocean uh, into our drains and go into the ocean affecting sea life as well as many of our clothes which we put for washing into the washing machine the the lint micro fabrics that also goes into the ocean so all of this uh, are avoided in such ocean friendly products and one thing you can also do which is, which can be interesting is to identify what's your carbon footprint like you have to uh, there are so many things online which you can just go and put some data it will it will give you the value so you can identify your carbon footprint understand where you can maybe cut down and you can check the ingredients labels recycling code so everything uh, every product every package Uh, that you get in in a plastic uh, package you have a recycling code in it at the back so you can check 1 to 7 you can check what is the recycling code and understand what that product is recycled into if it's recyclable or not all of this is going to help you contribute effectively uh, to just use products efficiently to their uh, to extend their shelf life like your clothes main thing is taking care of them 
and uh, preserving them well is going to uh, go a long way as well. And whatever shopping you do, uh, ensure that they have buyback for recycling and uh, there is even refills for your shampoo bottles and all you cannot for that kind of a service. Many companies are doing it. Many startups are doing it as well. And again, familiarizing yourselves with the five hours uh, concept. Now from three hours, there's gone to five hours, which is uh, to refuse at the first, reduce, reuse, recycle and rotting. Rotting is basically composting your organic uh, sort of waste. So all of the everyday products, right? Simply just going to your house, looking at each room individually, looking at what are the products there? How can I swap it for a better product? Say if it's, uh, um, how do I put it? If it's a, a toothbrush, if it's a toothpaste, a toothpaste, or uh, how do I replace it? There are something called tooth tabs where you don't have any packaging because the toothpaste uh, tube is not recyclable. You can use the tooth tabs and which foam up in the mouth and become a paste. Uh, there's even shampoo bars. Instead of having a shampoo bottle, there's shampoo bars. There's even biodegradable napkins, diapers, menstrual cups. I can keep on listing the products, right? But I feel like you guys have to go around, see individual product uh, and start your journey from there. One product at a time, you can just choose. Today, uh, you can go check if you have a, a one, uh, like choose one product, maybe a face wash, face cream, check ingredients, how good it is, uh, safe for you, safe for the ocean. And see, uh, you know, how you can reduce it. For me personally itself, I swapped out my uh, shampoo, which was so costly and so many bottles that I use. And uh, I got a very uh, organic, very cheaper one. Hardly, uh, you know, uh, contributes a lot uh, for me. So it really cut down and helped my budgeting as well. So uh, I, I learned, you know, so much that we can do. Even mosquito repellents, right? They are uh, harmful and you have very much uh, natural alternatives available, which is a little chemical free and does the job. So it's all about exploring. It's all about, uh, you know, making uh, choices that are right. Okay. Now we go on to as a community. So community uh, together, right? Like what you can do is basically some initiatives of community composting and recycling. So in many apartments and uh, bigger structures and what they do is they have a compost pit there. They do uh, together. They uh, uh, do the whole composting process like from various houses, not individual houses, but like together. So you have a big heap of compost, which you can use again for the gardening purpose. So that's a great thing that uh, uh, many people have started to follow. Green weddings, yes. I think this will be a very interesting, debatable topic. Green wedding because probably my parents will kill me if I say them I want a green eco wedding because I'm an only child and there's so much of uh, budgeting for marriage itself. So probably uh, they might kill me. But uh, green wedding basically is like, you know, you choose, uh, choose uh, decorations which are very... Uh, simple, very natural, and not go over the top uh, on your decorations. Use uh, usable cups, all of this. Uh, make ensure that your uh, food waste and all is recycled and uh, your plastic, there's no plastic waste, all of that. So there's so many ways you can do green weddings. I'm sure you can Google it. There's, uh, that can be a community thing where you involve people to take part and you are also educating them. And uh, sustainably traveling, make sure you're not throwing something littering in uh, uh, beautiful scenic spots. Uh, it was very uh, disheartening for me when I went to Himalayas for the first time with a lot of, you know, emotion streams. And I saw so much of plastic instead of all the mountains, beautiful lakes, and so many bottles and drinks, all of that uh, everywhere. So I remember that image more than the beautiful images, unfortunate, right? Like, so we should ensure that doesn't happen. And uh, secondhand clothing, you can form a group where you exchange clothes with your friends and the, these are also called as pre-loved clothes. So these all uh, cut down, uh, cuts down your uh, contribution to more textiles. There's even sustainable drinks, uh, which I think might be fascinating. There's drinks made out of CO2. Uh, there's an, a company called Air Vodka that, that does uh, drinks from CO2. There's sustainable beers which have uh, very less water consumption in, the, in, in their production side. You can even gift green gifts instead of uh, doing big wrapping in plastics and uh, the big uh, the, the big thing that comes on top. I, I'm forgetting the wrapping thing that comes. Instead of that, there's a beeswax wrap and there's like ribbons, which are uh, made of cloth that you can use as well. Best thing, again, as a community is carbon offsetting and investing in sustainable companies. So offsetting basically uh, is uh, you are cutting down your emissions by contributing to offsets. So these offsets are uh, tradable rights or certificates, which is linked to 
lower amount of CO2 atmosphere, uh, lower amount of CO2. Basically, the activities which reduce the amount of CO2 by buying these certificates. Uh, uh, you can buy these certificates from people who are selling it, or you can fund these projects. Like you can give money to projects which uh, lowers the carbon emission. So there's so much uh, that you can do, uh, even by investing in sustainable companies, promoting startups and companies uh, that are doing sustainable products and technology. So all of this as a community you can do. As a country, yes. So influencing the country as a whole uh, is either you follow or you become influencers. Uh, I think uh, they have uh, most hold these days. And uh, uh, as an influencer, if you are uh, either becoming one or following a proper, in, uh, like a validated person who is giving proper knowledge and awareness on uh, environment, that will be great. That's a great first step that you can take. Uh, even today, right? Like, and uh, hold campaigns, uh, voice out on when you see there's something false ha happening in this space. Considering a career in sustainability, in, you guys are already super social and doing a lot of service. Uh, so similar to that, considering careers in environment and sustainability, uh, choosing jobs in this field uh, and uh, working in terms of a uh, service uh, aspect, in projects, restoration projects, cleanup. There's a lot of NGOs working in this field also. Uh, and you guys might uh, definitely uh, have participated or know these as well. And uh, two most important things is entrepreneurship, which is my personal favorite is to either you guys become entrepreneurs or support the people who want to do entrepreneurship, work in these uh, climate and uh, sustainability based startups people who want to become entrepreneurs in this uh, domain support them in any way you can even just go promote them right like that's the least you can do which is going to make a difference for them and in go into indulge into research if you guys like research uh, do research into this come up with good technology very economically viable technology it's not over the top uh, so there is one thing i read you know they use uh, moon dust for fighting global warming. You can actually Google it. That was like, it gave me mixed reactions, right? Moon dust, you go and take, and then you fix earth. Like it doesn't, is it make sense or not? It might be fascinating, but practically, you know, doesn't make sense. But there's so much of technology. There's even green steel. Now, uh, world's first green steel was done in Sweden, like completely green uh, with reduced carbon emissions. There are so many things that you guys can come up with in terms of research as well and contribute or support people who want to go into research and entrepreneurship in this field uh, so that, you know, they can uh, again uh, continue to influence more people and con uh, help many people to contribute to the environment. Last but not least, if you're not doing any of this, that's not doing any anything is also the best thing you can do. This is contrary to the introduction because it's not about not doing nothing, but actually doing something good. That's what uh, they said in the intro. But what I feel is, you know, still people, uh, I mean, there's a lot going on with our lives every day. You have so many things that you face in terms of a career choice, uh, in terms of taking care of your family, so many things. Everyone has a lot of mental uh, emotions, a lot of mental ups and downs they go through every day. So the bare minimum that you can do is to not do something negative for the environment. That is to not uh, litter or uh, not do, uh, not make the choices which are wrong, which are supporting uh, people that are greenwashing or not add more burden by creating more junk and going for more simpler things. So much that you cannot do to save the environment also. So this is like the bare minimum. Even if you are not able to do all of that, I think if you do nothing, that's also something that is going to be significant. So uh, it's all about that one step that you start taking. It's all about the right step. That is the most important thing I want you to take away from this whole speech. Uh, for us and for our planet, it's all about the right step. So I am sure you all will take the right step and do awesome. So feel free to reach me anytime regarding anything you want in sustainability. If you guys have thought about entrepreneurship, I would love to dedicate my time to you, support you guys and uh, help you build your career. Or if you just want to know if this product is good or not, you want to talk about sustainability, anything uh, in that matter, I would love, love to uh, interact with you guys. And if you want to work some somewhere in this, you want internships, anything, right? Whatever you need, 
i would love to spend my time with you guys and uh, offer all the support that i can so thank you so much for sems foundation and divya for choosing me and giving me this opportunity and your valuable time for listening to me go on and on and on i hope i didn't bore you guys uh, i'm very happy to take any questions thank you so much guys thank you have a nice day thank you wow what a wonderful knowledge given by you ma'am i hope uh, our audience learned new things from this session so i would like to oh, add sorry sorry anjali one minute yes, i forgot the suspense thing shit i'm so sorry shit see shit i'm saying bu- for the bullshit part i forgot to tell them so oh yes, shit, it's not it's not re- this thing okay i'm not coming i have a problem displaying this but one give me one second actually it was a very interesting article uh, that i uh, found on google see you can google see the bullshit in sustainability there's an article yeah okay so this is this is a uh, very interesting article i think you guys should really check it out all the bullshit in sustainable so i was thinking like okay if that's bullshit there should be some unbullshitting also so i just named it like that so that's why i put the name as that so yeah you can go on anjali it was very effective for our audience and thank you so much for joining us and sharing your experience your precious time and knowledge with us so ma'am there are some of the questions uh, which our audience wants you to be answer so uh, okay. show so uh, we are starting so how can yeah. business ensure that they have the right expertise and knowledge within their teams to effectively implement sustainable strategies and initiatives okay great so how can business ensure if they are sustainable or not i think that is the question so yes, for businesses right like there are different classes of businesses in india if you see uh, now startups are coming up and there's something called msmes uh, where that medium small and uh, is all these uh, micro enterprises they call so there is this class of company and then there's the bigger corporations right the private or the corporates so all of these businesses have uh, now they have only one thing which is the frameworks uh, where you have to report that data that is how they communicate how sustainable they are to the public but how do we ensure is what uh, is the question right if you see the scientific ensuring uh, options then you have to go for what i said as lca right so nowadays people um, uh, take an lca of their product of their technology uh, when they pitch it even to the investors also now i am seeing many startups do that and uh, they show that their carbon emissions are reduced and they are actually making a positive impact so but that is the scientific way if you talk about the commercial way that uh, we are mandated to do it as businesses then there is certain frameworks uh, like your esg which i spoke about uh, those are some of the reports that companies have to give to ensure and show that you know they are uh, actually sustainable and they are practicing sustainability okay so second question is what are some common misconceptions or green washing tactics that companies use when they are claiming to be sustainable yes so i think uh, uh, as i mentioned the seven sins right so they are the categories that uh, it has been given to us and uh, we follow those kind of categories of sins that uh, are come under green washing but the most common one if i say is uh, actually uh, using uh, like in amazon okay amazon is an example when you go to amazon you can find so many products which are similar right there's there's, there's a slight change in a logo slight change in name many times i have actually ordered a wrong product uh, when i try to order a proper uh, green product i've seen like there's lot of fake products as uh, with uh, just change in small things so you can see there's lot of fake uh claims and fake uh, labels or uh, gimmicks that people use to make it green simply using green color doesn't mean it's green that is like the biggest uh how do i put it like the thing you should keep in mind uh, when you check a product if it's green don't ever believe that it's a green product so that's like the biggest form of green washing you can stay away from yeah that's a very good piece of advice ma'am and thank you so much for answering these questions again thank you you all for attending today's webinar and if you have any ad- additional questions you can contact us by email or telephone we're happy to provide you additional support to you please follow on our social media platform and subscribe to our youtube youtube channel for new learning stay connected to us for new learnings i anjali kushwaha host for today signing off have a wonderful day thank you thank you guys thank you